Live from the European Parliament here in Strasbourg, this is Raw Politics. Thank you for joining us tonight and this is what we have coming up for you. Escaping Europe, the UK's Foreign Secretary compares Brussels to a Soviet prison over Brexit. Exhaust, exhaustion, Europe takes aim at CO2 emissions and Germany's auto industry. Resolved to rename Macedonia's Prime Minister, he vows to join NATO and the EU despite a referendum setback. Catalonia protests, anger on the streets of Barcelona one year after they voted for independence. And 365 days of Putin, the Russian leader stars in his own calendar. Well, it's time to meet our panelists for tonight. We have, of course, Darren McCaffrey, our political editor at Your News. Darren, which of these stories do you like? Well, I think it has to be uh, Jeremy Hunt, whose speech yesterday seems to have sparked this bonfire of uh, anger and dismay uh, here on continental Europe, not least of all particularly among Eastern uh, Europeans, real sense that uh, he's put a foot wrong here. And the question is, for what reason? Why did he do this? Indeed, we will be getting into that. Uh, but tonight we're also joined by Sophie Infeld. She's a Dutch MEP with the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe. Sophie, which of these stories are you watching closely? Well, these days it's difficult to choose, uh, uh, but I would choose the same story because uh, this is not just about Jeremy Hunt. This is very much about the very essence of the European Union, I think. Absolutely. All right. Well, all that uh, and more in the, in the program tonight. But we begin with the UK's uh, Tory conference in Birmingham, where two high profile conservatives uh, were hoping to step out this week and show off their prime ministerial qualities. A lot of them doing that at that conference. Instead, they're under fire. One, the UK's foreign secretary in a spat with Brussels after comparing the EU to a Soviet prison. Now, Darren, this is, as you were saying earlier, this is causing quite a stir indeed, especially Jeremy, Jeremy Hunt's comments. Let's talk about yeah, that. We're normally used to his predecessor, Boris Johnson, making uh, gaffes and causing all sorts of trouble across uh, the continent. It is uh, Jeremy Hunt, though, the new British Foreign Secretary, who seems to have done it at uh, this time. As you say, what happens at this Conservative Party conference is each cabinet minister gets up and makes a speech. It was her, his turn uh, yesterday, and he really didn't hold back. Um, it was very much a kind of almost, where well, he referred to it, a, a Dunkirk uh, approach to Brexit, um, lots of patriotic talk clearly speaking to a domestic conservative audience, potentially pitching for a leadership role, but in doing so, uh, causing a lot of anger here on the continent. Let's hear from uh, Jeremy Hunt, who was speaking at that conference yesterday. I think we can hear from Jeremy Hunt. Uh, he was speaking at that conference, if we can listen to what he had to say, comparing the EU uh, to a Soviet prison. Do we have that? All right, well, the EU was set up to protect freedom. It was the Soviet Union that stopped people leaving. And the lesson from history is clear. If you turn the EU club into a prison, the desire to get out of it won't diminish, it'll grow. And we won't be the only prisoner that will want to escape. Pretty extraordinary stuff in uh, many regards. And as I say, it has sparked this real sense of, uh, of anger, I think, here. And, and it just keeps coming. Uh, today, we've heard from a whole series of people uh, connected with the Commission and the Council and indeed many Eastern European countries who were not happy with what uh, the British Foreign Secretary uh, had to say. Among them, uh, Germany's uh, Europe Minister, Michael Roth. He blasted it, insisting that, uh, uh, sorry, Jeremy Hunt, the EU is no prison. And we heard also from Guy Verhofstadt. He said it was offensive and outrageous, especially those millions of Europeans that lived under Soviet occupation. Latvia's ambassador to London said the Soviets killed, they deported, exiled and imprisoned hundreds of thousands of Latvia's inhabitants after the illegal occupation in 1940 and ruined lives of two generations while the EU has brought prosperity, equality, growth and respect. And even some criticism too uh, from 
the British establishment in some regards. This from Peter Ricketts, who ran the Foreign Office in London from uh, 2006 to 2010. He says, this rubbish is unworthy of a British Foreign Secretary. The EU isn't a Soviet-style prison. Its legal order has brought peace and prosperity after a century of, of war. So a real sign of, of anger there. Um, and also it was reflected somewhat uh, when we heard from the EU Commission spokesperson at the midday briefing in Brussels uh, today. Again, not holding back his thoughts on what uh, Jeremy Hunt had to say yesterday. Let's have a, a listen. I would say respectfully that uh, we would all benefit, and uh, in particular foreign affairs ministers, from opening a history book from time to time. That's the only comment I have. I mean, Sophie, I mean, we, we listen to these words. These are pretty harsh words, and I think it's, it's, we see it's escalating. Are the gloves coming off now that the you know, deadlines are coming, the deadline for Brexit is coming? What are we witnessing now with these exchange of words? Look, I, I don't know why Jeremy Hunt felt the need to say this. Uh, incidentally, there is an irony in the fact that Brexiteers, you know, across uh, the aisles, I would almost say, seem to feel the need to lecture the European Union on how to arrange their internal business, even after they're gone. I really don't see why. But uh, I don't know why he made these remarks. I think they are uh, completely distasteful. Uh, they are very painful because, you know, some people still remember what the inside of a Soviet prison looks like. It's not that far away. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. and I, I think, you know, why, even if he was making those remarks for his own domestic audience, um, you know, was, was he not thinking that other people are watching too? No, absolutely. It, it, it's, it, that, that aside, because this has obviously hit, it is, it's sensitivities have been, have been hit by that comment. But that aside, does he have a point in the essence of what he's trying to say in the sense that the EU might be holding on too tightly, that, that people feel that they're locked in? Is, is there a point to that message? Oh, sorry, I, I really don't understand, you know, what, what that's supposed to mean. I mean, the EU, the EU are... First of all, uh, the governments of the member states and the people. And they chose voluntarily to be part of this family as a majority of British people has chosen to leave it. So, uh, and, and you know, that's foreseen in the treaties. Uh, and you can actually see that ever since the Brexit vote took place, that support for membership of the EU is growing. So nobody is forced to stay. And I think it is, it is increasingly clear for everybody that it's, it's very important to, to stick together. Uh, Jeremy Hunt was clearly playing to a domestic audience. Uh, there is increasing talk that this man uh, could be a future prime ministerial material. I think the essence of what he's trying to get us here, though, is that Article 50, that, is trig that triggers the Brexit process, is clearly stacked in the European Union's favour. It is clearly designed to discourage members from leaving. Uh, second of all, there is an attitude among some people, particularly potentially the French, uh, that may want to punish Britain or to at least give the impression Sorry. that other countries this is oh, not a this is, process this is all, to go you know, this is, this is beginning to sound a little bit like, uh, I don't know, Monty Python or something, you know, the French. <laughs> well, this, this whole story, that's a myth of the French or anybody else wanting well, to... Wanting to let me finish, let me finish. Okay, wanting to punish the British, that's nonsense. If you, you know, the mood here is a completely different one. People are really, really sad about Britain leaving and they're becoming sadder as the date is approaching. It wasn't our choice, okay? Nobody wants to punish. That Article 50, which incidentally is in the treaty that was also supported by the no, no, UK no, I, government. I, I'm, not, I'm not speaking that, that it, it was uh, that Britain signed up to this, but yeah, clearly, but, but look, if clearly you're, the if European you're, Union the, it is makes making no this sense. process... Clearly, the European Union is making this process difficult, is understandable. Yeah, they do not sorry. want people to leave. And there is a sense, that I think, that what Jeremy Hunt is trying to convey, potentially, is that for a lot of British people, they feel that they're being punished because they made a democratic decision. But you know why they feel leave. that right. way? You know why they feel that way? Because they've been told this nonsense by, by the media the whole time. I mean, you know, it is simply not true. But you cannot expect... The point is that all the proposals so far, you know, when the government finally seemed to agree to some degree on proposals, 
Brussels because you know it took them two years to figure out what they actually wanted in leaving the European Union. And then they're asking for something which is impossible, namely breaking up the internal market. It's ridiculous. It was the Brits who, and uh, I very much agree, the Brits who've been pushing for the creation of the internal market, for the development of the internal market, and now they're leaving this saying, oh, but actually, you know, we only want the one pillar out of out of four. I okay, mean, come on, that's simply, you cannot expect the European Union to unravel itself just to please the Tory party, because this whole problem has only emerged because right. of the it, internal it, it, rift in the Tory it, it's party. Not, it, it, and, and, and that is in, it, to a degree true, but it is just this sense of, like, this is not a club you can just walk away from. Now, that is understandable because it's been a union uh, that Britain has integrated itself over the last 40 yeah. years for, and the EU needs to protect itself. But in doing so, clearly Britain feels slightly boxed in because yeah, but, of... Sorry, right. i give another, but, another example, okay. because when it's about security, OK, then the Brits are saying, oh, but then we want to be in. So it's also, you know, it, there is a, a large degree of hypocrisy here. So let's be honest. They were members for almost 45 years, we are sad that they're leaving. You know, many Brits are also sad that they're leaving. Uh, it all doesn't look as rosy as the Brexiteers had, had promised them uh, it would be. So to now say, oh, it's, you know, the EU is to blame, because this is a blame game. This is all about pointing the finger at the EU for the problems that have been caused by the Brexiteers, basically. Um, all right, very, very quickly, because... I, I, yeah, I just, I just think what is interesting, aside from all of that, is... Um, that Jeremy Hunt, A, made this speech in the way that he did. He clearly was playing to that domestic yeah. audience and people will have liked it. Um, listening to this backlash today, including from, you know, uh, some did other people who work at the Commission, at we loss, talk about actually. having been born in the Gulag, imprisoned yeah. by the KV, yeah. KGB a few times. He's, this man goes on to say he's happy to brief you on the main difference between the EU and the Soviet Union uh, and why we escaped the USSR. And I think the, 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 the choice of comparison is something now that, the British Foreign Secretary, Britain's Backfired. chief diplomats, Absolutely. will be regretting. Indeed. And do, very quickly, do you think it, has, uh, it was at the expense also of negotiations? This move, this well, I think that's domestic more interesting. audience. Will this have a real impact? I don't will think it be? Will. will it? No. Do you think it will? I don't think no. so. <laughs> All right. We're, we Very agree on that. Debate. Indeed, at least there's that. one thing you agree on. All right, let's stay with Brexit, though, because there is really a lot going on today, and it's all in the Brexit brief. Remember this? Back in 2016, the Brexit campaigners tore the UK in a bright red bus emblazoned with a bold pledge. Leaving the EU would save £350 million a week. Fast forward to... And a new report from the Centre for European Reform finds that Brexit is costing the UK 560 million euros each week in lost revenue. This as companies have cut investment amid Brexit uncertainty. One thing that is certain, Boris Johnson really likes bridges. In an interview with the Sunday Times, he suggested a bridge between mainland Britain and Northern Ireland, saying it would signify a belief in Britain. It's the third bridge Johnson has suggested in recent years, following a so-called garden bridge over the River Thames and a 35-kilometre bridge to France. And amid all the Brexit uncertainty, Theresa May has a plan, a party plan. She announced plans for a festival of Great Britain and Northern Ireland to take place after Brexit in 2022. And reminisced about the great national exhibitions of the past, which showcased the best of Britain and attracted millions. All right, well, we have another referendum that we are watching closely tonight. Macedonia's prime minister is vowing to move forward with a name change for the former Yugoslavic Republic, despite a disappointing vote on Sunday. Now, with just 37% turnout, the vote failed to meet the threshold of 50%, and it's largely seen as a defeat for the West. Now, of those who did vote, 91% voted in favor of joining the EU and NATO, which is only possible if Macedonia becomes North Macedonia. The Results uh, where we celebrations from the Prime Minister, and he says he'll push the results through Parliament where he needs two thirds majority. But the opposition who called for a boycott is also claiming victory. All right, well, we are joined in the studio by Sophie Enfeld. She's still with us, a Dutch MEP with the ALDE Group. And also joining us for this discussion is Alois Petterle, a Slovenian MEP with the EPP. He leads the parliamentary group uh, for relations with the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. I'll start with you, uh, Alois. How how big really is a division in Macedonia? 
When two sides celebrate victory at the same time, this means division, uh, polarization, and uh, we have yes and no situation in uh, Macedonia. Uh, low turnout, uh, formerly the referendum did not succeed, but on the other side, strong yes of those who appeared on the referendum. All right, but it's not just a referendum we're looking at. There's a bigger picture here, right? What is the significance? Of what, what is at stake? I think that uh, it's really more than just a referendum. Uh, uh, but the main, the, the main point was uh, to get closer, to, to finish with the conflict with Greece and then to get membership of NATO and to start negotiations with the European Union. With that result, uh, at the moment, uh, there is no perspective in that direction. Okay, well, why is it so important that, I'll put this to you, Sophie, why is it so important that Macedonia joins NATO or the EU? Well, I think, yeah, it is indeed about choosing, you know, in what direction they're going to look, uh, east or west, you might say. And I think uh, with all its shortcomings uh, and everything you can complain about, the European Union is still a massive peace project and stability. I mean, uh, uh, you know, we like to complain about it, how bureaucratic it is. Um, but in the end, I mean, we have created a continent where the quality of life is better than anywhere else. And we know that there are forces outside the European Union, let's say, at the, toward, to the east of the European Union, who are trying to, uh, to sow discord everywhere in Europe uh, and with a degree of success. And therefore, I think it is, it's really sad that there is... This, um, this division in Macedonian society, because yeah. I think together we would be much stronger. And, and you know, this is, uh, there's a lot of attention for a country of two million people, so clearly it is important in, in, in the geopolitical sense. What is the view? So I'll ask the same question to you about why is it so important for Macedonia to join NATO? It's interesting that all six countries uh, in different statuses wish to share European values and principles. They like to join, uh, and this would be the best solution. Uh, I belong to those who are sure that there is no better alternative, uh, and we need peace and stability, democracy, developments in, in Balkans. Uh, um, Thousands of people uh, or of citizens of those countries are living uh, to mm. the West and uh, we have to invest into that region. If not now, then we will pay later. And I would like to add that uh, also in uh, Macedonia, a mm. uh, position, this means the government and the opposition share the same ambition to join the European Union. But in the now, when the sol solution is uh, close, uh, they are different. All right. Well, Montenegro, just bringing in another country, Montenegro joined uh, NATO last year. And this past July, uh, U.S. President Donald Trump, he made headlines when he was asked if the U.S. would defend it uh, as part of NATO. And he told Fox News, Montenegro is a tiny country with very strong people. They're very aggressive, he says. They may get aggressive. And congratulations, you're in World War III. Now, listening to that kind of, of, of statement, Macedonia, uh, looking at this, what kind of protection do they think they're going to get from, from NATO with its biggest member, uh, Donald Trump, uh, the president, speaking this way? <laughs> well, you know, with, with Trump, you never really know what to believe. I mean, uh, and uh, very often he makes a bold statement and realizes that, uh, you know, he's, he put his foot in it and then retracts. But they uh, are retracts. the biggest but, uh, member. Yes, but he, he is, what he says is not necessarily always the policy of the United States. And for the time being... Uh, let's assume that they will still be a loyal member. But it's clear that within NATO there are very serious discussions going on about, um, you know, the, 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 the commitments and everybody's responsibility. And I think one, uh, not specifically about Montenegro, but one uh, message that the European Union should heed is that we should start taking more responsibility for our own continent, our own security, and not always rely on the Americans to, um, you know, to protect us. May, may, may I just add that yes. another former Yugoslav Republic, its name is Slovenia, another tiny country, was supported by the United States and welcomed in as a NATO member. So, all right, and, and bringing up, uh, you know, Russia when when Macedonia said that, you know, they express interest. Russia said, well, you're you're going to be a target. You're going to be a clear target if you end up joining NATO. Is it worth it for Macedonia to do so? I suppose in in the context of Balkans. Uh, for Russia, Balkans uh, has been uh, a playground for a long time, but. Uh, Again, I would say the best for all the players, also for Russia, 
uh, would be if that part of Europe lands entirely in the European Union, which does not oppose but tries to share uh, values and principles. All right, and from the European Union's view, this is exactly where they're, they're yes, headed. Yes, this is, this is about stability, uh, you know, on the Western Balkans in, in, in general. Uh, and I, I know that, uh, you know, the Russians are, are, they're not very happy about all these developments. But in the end, I think we will be better neighbours. We will be better partners, as Alois said, uh, if the European Union is, is strong. And we don't, you know, stability... I don't think that's stability. the view that they would hold, but... Uh... No, you know, but not in terms of military might, but in, in terms of stability, prosperity, respect for the rule of law, um, you know, that makes, us, that makes us a better partner for everybody. All right, and just very quickly, what's next? I mean, do you think this is going to get through Parliament in Macedonia? Very quickly. Uh, it's difficult to say, because the situation is polarized. Uh, there is already in the air the idea of, of snap elections. Uh, I think that it will be very difficult to get a uh, two-thirds majority to change the constitution. All right, thank you very much for that. Well, speaking of Russia, if you can't get enough of Vladimir Putin, you don't have to worry. That's in today's edition of Eurostars. Let's take a look. Just in time for the holidays, Vladimir Putin's calendars for 2019 hit the shelves in shops across Russia. They feature Putin in a range of poses, from cuddling animals to marching with soldiers to taking selfies with a bridal party. In the past, Putin's swag has been popular in Russia, but with falling approval ratings and protests over retirement ages, we'll have to see if there's still an appetite for 365 days of Putin. I mean, his popularity right now, it's, it's suffering. Do you think this is going to help at all? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> can you say anything serious about this? No. I mean, this is his strategy. I mean, you know, in, yeah. in, in, in Russia, this is but look, I mean, showing himself you know, you in can, an image. You of, can, you, as they say, you can fool some people all of the time and you can fool all people some of the time, but you cannot fool all people all of the time. I mean, at some point, you know, people will say that's all very well, but I don't want a calendar. I want a proper pension or I want a job Absolutely. or I want, a, I want a house. I mean, seriously speaking, though, do you think Vladimir Putin has reached a point where, well, his popularity is not, is not as it was, is his hold on power? Hey. I would say he has uh, many lives. Okay. <laughs> it seems so. And now you have 365 days of him. All right, thank you very much for that. Coming up on Raw Politics, there is a lot more. Europe's love affair with diesel and setting new targets on how much cars can pollute. And we also have this on the streets of Barcelona one year after Catalonia voted for independence. Don't go away, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now, CO2 emissions are in the air in Strasbourg this week. MEPs are gearing up to vote on how much cars and vans will be allowed to pollute. Now, the issue has become politically toxic with discord within groups and parties on how much carbon can be curbed without damaging the economy. The commission was accused last year of giving the car industry a, quote, early Christmas present with its original proposals. Now, in the wake of the Dieselgate scandal in which Volkswagen admitted cheating emissions tests, Parliament has taken a harder line. Wednesday's vote could offer an indication of whether industry trumps ecology for MEPs. And I am joined in the studio to, cut, to talk about cutting carbon by um, Miriam Dali. She is from the S&D Group. Now, you, you are the rapporteur of that report uh, that we are talking about. And also by Benjamin Krieger, your head of government affairs of CLEBA. This is an automotive uh, industry association. All right. I just want to bring in some numbers before we get into the discussion, because the commission uh, has pushed the push to reduce emissions by 15 percent by 2025 and 30 percent by 2030. The parliament has been uh, much stronger in that, calling for 20 percent reduction by 2025 and 45 percent by 2030 so i'm just reading you these numbers because the the point there is the commission had one proposal and, and miriam i want to go to you your report is get is more is a very very ambitious is it too ambitious as industry would probably say 
I don't think it is too ambitious um, because it is not a question of the environment versus the industry, but it is a balance between the environment and the industry. All figures are showing that if we are more ambitious, we can actually continue leading the race. Because I believe that if we continue pushing change, if we continue postponing, we will be um, having a larger negative impact on the industry's competitiveness and ultimately jobs. And I'm saying this because all the studies are showing that if we look at 40% CO2 reduction and even more than that, it is a question of making sure that we try to keep um, in line with the Paris Agreement targets, but at the same time making sure that we do not let other continents um, run ahead of us when it comes to cleaner technology. And I'm speaking about cleaner technology because ultimately I'm not interested in one technology over the other. I'm interested in having a mix of different technologies which can actually and really and truly help us achieve the reductions in CO2 both for 2025 and also for 2030 and I say beyond that because we need to have a long term uh, pathway even to give peace of mind to industry itself. I mean, from the automotive industry, I mean, you, you would disagree with that because you, from the automotive industry, what is, do you think this report is, is fair? Well, first of all, from the point of view of the automotive suppliers, that's parts and components that go into vehicles, uh, the objective of reducing emissions is fully embraced. Uh, that is a shared objective. And we would like to contribute to sharing. Uh, to then the, then this, uh, this ambitious uh, target should not be a problem for the industry. We feel the proposal by the European Commission uh, was very balanced, taking into account many different factors, uh, impact on the industry and the environment, as Mrs. Dali has pointed out. Uh, what we believe also is that if we go far beyond uh, the proposal of the Commission, then negative impact would be stronger then we would go much more into the direction of prescribing specific technologies and this inherently would be a very bad outcome for, for industry. Well, you're talking, you know, you're, you, it, it's almost like invest now and reap the rewards later, isn't it, for the industry? I mean, why is it, you know, why is it such a big deal if, you, if, if the industry doesn't just go far now and, and reap the rewards of, of cutting emissions later? Well, many of our members, actually all our members, want to go far. The ones that are active in the in, in drivetrain business. For the suggestion example, of Miriam Dali, the, the, the 40% 40, 40 reduction, isn't it? Which, uh, on the drivetrain, for example, which is relevant. Uh, the problem is with the very high proposals that are currently under discussion in the European Parliament, uh, we are not going towards a transformation of the industry and of our mobility towards more electri electrified drivetrains, for example but we would risk a disruption. Uh, we would risk a negative impact on employment, for example. But that's what Miriam was just disagreeing with, that in fact it will not have, is that, is that what you're saying? It even, the latest, even the latest figures um, uh, presented by the Commission itself um, speak and show that the more ambitious we are, the more jobs we are creating. So if we're speaking, for example, about a 40% or even a 45% CO2 reduction, we are looking at creating more jobs. If we are producing batteries within the European Union itself, and we're speaking about a 40% CO2 reduction, we're speaking about the creation of 92,000 jobs. Um, if we go further than that, 45%, we're speaking about the creation of 151,000 jobs. I don't look at right. this industry as just one legislation. There has to be a whole package. But reality is that we have car manufacturers in the EU that are investing seven times more than they are doing in the EU in China. Why is that? We have workers' council, with whom I spoke, who can't understand why a battery production unit can't open in the EU because the excuse was okay. that EU salaries are very high, but then a Chinese company opens a battery production unit in the EU. Benjamin, I, I, I want to ask you about for, from, the, from, the, from the industry's point of view, you know, you've, the industry has suffered a lot of, of uh, image disruption uh, from the scandals, Dieselgate, you have the Volkswagen uh, scandal. Wouldn't it be beneficial to just take on, you know, something big like this and regain the trust again of people? Undoubtedly, it's a very critical point in time to regulate the car industry because indeed what you have just mentioned has led to an impact, it has negatively impacted credibility. That's, that's completely clear. Uh, but I would like to respond to something uh, that Ms. Dali has pointed out. Uh, the studies from the European Commission, for example, they looked at the proposals of 50% reduction, 45% reduction, 40% reduction, and they come to results which differ a bit from what you've just said. Uh, they see a negative impact on employment and they do not see the not societal really. benefit. Okay. 
Uh, this is a misinterpretation okay. of figures because what the Commission does when it speaks about jobs in the different sectors, because if we're speaking about this transition, we're speaking about different sectors, it speaks about the creation of jobs. And you know that figure. It speaks about the 92,000 creation jobs across the EU. It speaks about, one, about 151,000 creation of jobs. It speaks about the automotive sector, and you're right. But when it speaks about the 40%, it speaks about 12,000 impact on jobs across the EU until the 2030, which I do understand and I'm concerned about because in my report I speak also about the just transition of workers to actually address workers in their regions and in their communities. But let's be frank, the European Commission in its blueprint um, addressing the automotive sector, it speaks about the need to find um, employment, to find employees for 900,000 jobs between 2017 until 2025 because of retirements. So, I kindly ask everyone, let's look at the whole picture and let's make sure that we have a legislation that delivers. Okay, do you want to respond to that quickly? I'm not sure that we can, uh, that we can put these like equals next to each other. Uh, there will be job losses in parts of the industry. There will be jobs gained in other parts of the industry. The problem is we don't know where the new jobs will be created. We don't know when they will be created. And we aren't even sure that they actually are going to be created in the European Union. Uh, so this is no, where we about jobs in the EU, huh? This is where we would underline the need for a transition, sure. but not a tran not a disruption. All right, we don't have much time, but I, I would like to ask you, Miriam, is there a deficit between the talk of cutting emission target emissions targets here in Europe versus the will of the people to actually go in that direction? Just very quickly. I don't think so. I mean, if you, even if you look at what cities are doing in uh, various countries across the EU, um, I think we need to trigger change. I believe in a policy that triggers change. If we are going to sit down and um, expect things to happen, we'll see other continents taking the lead. I don't want that to happen for the European Union and its citizens, particularly for its workers. All right. Thank you very much to both of you. Do you want very, very quickly, but 10 seconds? The regulation is going to drive transition. The okay. problem is we are sitting in two camps, electrification, tra traditional combustion engine, and this is not going to so bring this us is, further. This is clearly a debate, that's, going to this is clearly a debate yes. that's going to Definitely. go on because there's a lot more going on in Strasbourg, carbon emissions being one of them. But let's take a look at what else is on the agenda with Strasbourg in 60. The last time EU leaders met for a formal summit, migration dominated. Well, the next one is just around the corner, and this week in Strasbourg, we'll get a sneak peek at the agenda. MEPs will face EU Commission and Council representatives tomorrow. Expect Brexit to feature prominently. On Wednesday, it's all about the rule of law in Romania. MEPs will have their say on how the government's judicial reforms have affected the country's democracy, setting the stage for another East versus West showdown. Italy announced last week it was going to abolish poverty. This week, MEPs will have their say, and they'll debate the idea of a basic income in Europe. And after the break, we'll talk about how U.S. President Donald Trump really feels about Kim Jong-un. Plus, we'll also be talking about protests in Catalonia one year after a failed bid for independence. Have secessionist tendencies in Europe been quashed? Don't go away. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now, Catalan separatists flooded the streets of Barcelona today on the first anniversary of the unauthorized independence vote. Thousands of pro-independence demonstrators blocked train stations, railways and motorways and pushed through police barricades in protest. But despite the big turnout, polls suggest that Catalans are evenly split over whether to secede. A year after the Catalonian administration staged a vote in defiance of the Spanish government. All right, well, let's uh, talk about this issue with Darren McCaffrey, our political editor. He's back with us. And Ramon Tremosa, he's an MEP for the Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe and who is from Catalonia. Well, let's uh, start with you. I mean, one year since that failed bid for independence, I mean, at what point does Catalonia and Spain just say, OK, let's just move on from this issue? Well, 
Um, after the referendum that we hold one year ago, uh, there was the dissolution of the Catalan autonomy by the Popular Party government, snap elections uh, in December last year, uh, under uh, unbelievable conditions in Europe, in Western Europe, because half of the government were in prison, the other in exile. And instead of this, before Christmas, we got, uh, the pro-independence parties got 2.1 million votes, mm -hmm. the record hike ever in a regional election, so uh, got a new absolute majority. And I want to remind that it's not a question of one year on. In the last seven years, all the elections in Catalonia, pro-independence and pro-referendum parties, has got between 55 and 65 percent of the votes. So we have a problem on the table. All right, so you, do you think that this, this is still going to continue from the pro-independence point of view? Of it course. It's going to... All the polls. To are, what end? To uh, well, uh, separation? We, we also uh, were the kingmakers to change the Spanish government uh, a few months ago. And all the polls, including official polls done by the Spanish state in Madrid, are showing that the younger the people is in Catalonia, much more preference for independence. And the more education degree level has the population in Catalonia has, more preference for independence. So it's time that Madrid, uh, someone is realizing that we have a problem because until now they have been denying all kind of problem and of all kind of dialogue. This is the reality. So this is why this is going, peaceful demonstrations will go if there is no political debate and solu political solutions on the But the, the government now, I mean, it's, it's friendlier to... to yeah, I mean, okay, what, we, we, we've had a year, uh, Tessa, uh, since uh, we saw that referendum, and in some ways lots have changed. Um, we've seen a change of governments mm. um, in Madrid, um, but no real substantial movement, actually, and uh, there's still very little dialogue between both sides, and there's still very little movement from both sides. And also, when you look at opinion polls, you might be right on young people being more in favour, but actually there's a little sign that there's been a big public shift one way or the other. So, uh, where do we go to next? Well, it's difficult to know. We've seen people on the streets. We've seen a million people in September on the streets. That's likely to continue. We've got the trials starting in the new year. Um, what route and what form they take, uh, how harsh the punishments might well be, that could change uh, events. But at the moment, there seems to be essentially deadlock. Um, and one of the people who've not really been involved in this process an awful lot has been the European Union. Yes, Europe uh, has been... Is that uh, No, no, no. Uh, only Donald Tusk has clearly said uh, we need political solutions. Also Angela Merkel in October in a council meeting uh, forced Rajoy to, to talk about politics and offer federal reform of Spain, uh, German commissioner has done so, a Belgian prime minister also tweeted against uh, violence and asking for political dialogue. But of course, uh, when you come to the European Commission, these are uh, controlled by the council and, and popular party I, I, had I influence mean, on that. So, so uh, uh, as in many other issues, the Commission is just a secretary of the Council, no leadership. Yeah, but the position no, uh, that they're taking with, with regards to Catalonia, it's all, it's, it's preventative. Like they don't want to open the gates to, to no, but siding th with... There was an, an, in a Scotland a referendum. Sure. And, and, and it was agreed by the two governments. And also in Quebec, uh, Catalans are asking just for this. Let me uh, make you a forecast. Uh, there were only 100,000 pro-independentist voters 10 years ago in Catalonia. Now there are 2.1 million. In five years, if nothing has changed, we will be 60% in favor of independence or more. And nothing will stop then. But, well, you say nothing will stop them, but how can they achieve it? We are in a, de should, should, in a European should, Union based should, should, on should, democracy and, and fundamental rights and values. But, so shouldn't Europe do more to protect yeah. those rights? Uh, uh, in, in principle, in, of course, we, we feel so in Catalonia. Why the Scot Scottish people with less majority in the Scottish Parliament than us got a referendum and why we were are always denied right. in these rights? What, why I cannot speak Catalan in the, in the European Parliament? When in the United Nations Catalan is allowed because of Andorra, which is a country with a Catalan... So, so this is not a 21st century European Union. Yeah, and, and also my, my question is that 
this is, yes, it's been going on for a long time, but it's one year since that failed referendum independence bid. What message does this send to others in, in Europe or with the secessionist ideas um, in Europe? I mean, does this send a message of, well, you know what, it's probably not going to work? Well, I think it sends a message that Europe's not necessarily going to be there to help them because lots and lots of countries are dealing with uh, issues of cessation. We see Corsica in France, as you say, in the United Kingdom. We've got Scotland and Northern Ireland, obviously. Uh, the Irish issue is particularly a live one. And that's not to say there are a whole other Wallonia and Belgium. I mean, you could go on and on and on. Maybe a surprise that the European Union doesn't want to open up Pandora's box. They feel that it is very much up to the reserve of nation states. Uh, the problem is, where does this go to uh, next in Catalonia? Because there doesn't seem to be any obvious solution. When it comes to places like Scotland and Northern Ireland, though, we could see some movement, uh, not least of all because they're not terribly Brexit supporting. As uh, you, you rightly say, or the not. story is not over, Who knows? isn't it? Who knows? Who knows? It's Who knows? not over, though. We'll be watching that. All right, it's time now for tonight's raw moment, a touching moment to care of US President Donald Trump about his relationship with North Korean leader Kim Jong un. I was really being tough, and so was he. And we would go back and forth, and then we fell in love, okay? No, really. He wrote me beautiful letters, and they're great letters. We fell in love. Got to rely you on could, Trump. You couldn't, you, couldn't, couldn't make... you couldn't make it up. Uh, I mean, uh, the extraordinary thing is, is that change in relationship from going to call him Rocket Man right. this time last year to <laughs> where he is year. today, uh, one year later. The problem is, despite the love letters, there hasn't really been any substantial progress. And it is interesting that Donald Trump's use of language and his talk about how great friends they are on this substantive issue of nuclear disarmament, there's hardly been any. I mean, we can rely on him to always say something. Do you have anything to say about uh, what he's saying? About Kim this is the kind of populism <laughs> politics that I don't like because maybe right. uh, five years ago, uh, Donald Trump didn't know where North Korea was in the map. He might still not. He might still not. <laughs> we don't know. Good yes. point. All right, thank you very much thank to you. our guests and all our panels tonight this evening. And thank you for watching us on World Politics. Do get in touch with us at Euronews and use the hashtag WorldPolitics. See you again tomorrow.